Bootlegging in the Hills, written by Iris Culver Meadows, narrated by Laura Meadows. Some people thought it wasn't true. They thought the pictures of Ozark hillbillies dressed in overalls and a greasy straw hat, drinking from a crockery jar of moonshine balanced on his shoulders was just for dramatic or comic effect. These disbelievers had never been taken into the hillbillies' confidence. One of the strongest characteristics of the hill people is distrust of outsiders. These suspicions are most strong towards outsiders, but sometimes extended to each other. In a crucial operation like moonshining, only the producers and buyers knew very much about it. The bootleggers made homebrew, a kind of beer, and white light whiskey. During the prohibition years of the 1920s and 30s, the sale of alcohol was illegal, except for wine and weak beer. These restrictions made the underground liquor business quite profitable, but extremely risky. In the rural Ozarks, the respectable farmers with a great deal to lose stared clear of the bootlegged business. Its operations fell to shady characters and, unfortunately, to some of the young adults from respectable families. It was dangerous to drink illegally made alcohol. One could get lead poisoning that might cause blindness, permanent crippling like Jake Leg, or even death. Lead came from the equipment of bootleggers used from soldered in pipe joints and sometimes from old used car radiators. What did children know about all this? Very little. But one day, quite unsuspectingly, Newt and Jenny made a discovery. Early one afternoon, with the warm sun beaming down on them, the children went for a leisurely walk on the farm. They traveled north past the pond at the edge of which they lingered for a moment. They spoke of how nice it would be to have hundreds of fish swimming around in the water and themselves armed with fishing rods. But for the present, it was just interestingly muddy water in which the cattle trampled and drank. They soon tired of these speculations and edged their way through the blackberry patches and on into the woods. It was cool in the shade of the tree, for the branches filled the air above them with thick green leaves. They studied nature only for what it meant to them and felt themselves to be some wild creatures of the woods. Eventually the path gave out and they wandered on to one side where some velvety purple violets and they ran towards a thicket to pick them. When they emerged, their hands filled with tiny flowers, they were startled to see a small group of men shielded by the bushes ahead of them. Get back, Newt said as he pushed Jenny before him and out of sight. What is it? What's the matter? She said with surprise. She saw nothing to be alarmed at. They were usually glad to meet neighbors. Those men should be here. I wondered what they were up to. Let's go ask. No, no, it's not safe. On second thought, she realized that it was strange for the men to be in this part of the woods so far from everything. They were carrying something. Each man held a corner and they carted the box or crate to the shade of a big tree where they set it down and went back for another box. They carried their booty along the banks and creeks that marked the boundaries between the Culver Farm and that of the Reverend Argus Reeves. This small trickle of water that roamed around rocks and under the bare tree roots that lined its edges was known as Widow's Creek. In the rush of spring rains, it had been known to carry men to their death. At this time, however, the water was low. The men were able to cross it on unsteady rocks and carry crates of some mysterious object to a hiding place. Close at the heels of this strange crew of about a half a dozen young men scampered a pack of starved hounds, their rib cages as pronounced as the bars of a jail. Suddenly, one of this yelping, sniffing, hunting pack broke from the trail and bolted straight for the hiding place of Newton Jenny. It's Reeves' dog, Newton said as the dog came close, its tail wagging in a friendly gesture. One of the men stopped to look after the dog as if he feared detection. Get, get, go away, Newt coaxed in a soft voice. The tail wagging stopped and the poor dog, as if in the sadness of rejection, turned and ran back the way he had come. That was a close one, Newt said to Jenny as he breathed a sigh of relief, a bit shaken from the close call. The children drew back further into the brambles, looking through a small opening in the thicket. They could still see the men lowering boxes down into a hole in the ground. Following this one ragged-looking man picked up a shovel and scooped dirt over the top of their hidden treasure. Some arguing broke out over how to scratch out footprints and place broken branches in the already obscured spot. Then they parted merrily, each going his own way. What are they hiding? Jenny asked. How should I know? Newt answered impatiently. The only way to find out is to go out there and look. Jenny felt put in her place, and her place was to follow behind Newt, as he cautiously led the way to investigate the object of their interest. They advanced slowly, watching all the while to be sure the men did not return. Soon, Newt was pulling aside the covering of 
branches and with a few finishing kicks against the dirt, unearthed the tops of the boxes. In a second jerk, he opened a lid and exposed dusty brown bottles filled with liquid. With his deft, small hands, he removed one of the bottles and holding a rock just so, get the lid off. A gush of foam bubbled up and spilled over the side onto the ground. Newt capped the top with his lip and drank big mouthfuls. Don't drink that. Let's go, Jenny cried, fear showing in her big blue eyes. Ignoring her completely, Newt talked as if to himself. It's homebrew, all right, he affirmed, making more tests. Let's go home, his sister pleaded. What if they come back? And that's white lightning, he said, still ignoring her. After a while, Newt was satisfied that he knew all about what the men had done. He threw away the bottles he had emptied and rearranged the remaining bottles to cover the theft. Then they closed the box and put everything back the way it was. They hurried home the way they had come, ignoring the thorns and poison ivy. Soon they had come upon a path which made their progress easier. But even so, Newt kept wanting to lie down and rest at every sunny spot they came upon. The only thing that kept him going was his search for twigs that he thought he could whittle out and make into good whistles. He had made several good ones and in general loved the art of wood carving. Boy, won't Dad be surprised, Jenny said gleefully, thinking of the important news she had for him about the bootleggers. What do you mean? Newt asked anxiously. Why, when we tell him where the moonshine is, right there in our woods. Don't you dare tell him. Don't you dare tell anybody. They'll kill us. Bootleggers kill people for less than that. Well, all right, she said reluctantly, but I think Dad ought to know. He don't believe in breaking the law. Newt was so tired when they reached home that he stretched out on the bed and slept a long, long time. While he slept, Jenny forgot and built a fire in the cook stove with the sticks he had gathered to make whistles. In days to come, she kept her promise to tell no one about the moonshine hidden in the hole in the ground in the woods, but her ears perked up whenever someone mentioned Reeves and bootleg and in the same breath. Old Reverend Reeves was a tall, hearty, energetic man and a veritable bundle of energy. Not content to be just a farmer, he owned and operated country store of Lick Skillet, as well as preaching on Sunday and on revival nights. All his endeavors strangely came together in illicit bootleg business, which thrived in spite of his zealous opposition. While he shouted its vices from the pulpit to the churchgoers in the pew, bargains in the sale of moonshine were being struck outside on the churchyard within the sound of his voice. There were those who heard but did not listen. The preacher was unaware of the dual purpose of the church gatherings. Although the preacher hoped others would join him, he was content to wage a one-man war against bootlegging. He visited homes looking for stills. It is said that one house had a still in the attic, and although he looked the place over thoroughly, or so he thought, he did not find it. He scoured the countryside, walked across everybody's fields, and went deep into the woods of the neighbors, but to no avail. He searched, netted nothing, and yet the moon shining went on. He was sure it was going full force because someone was stealing sugar, corn, and potatoes from the lick skillet while he was home asleep. So much of his, so much was being stolen, he thought he would have to close the store. None. Then one day, when he was home minding his own business, the farming business this time, he accidentally came upon a still on his own farm. He had started out to search for a newborn calf and its mother that had wandered away from the herd. His search led him through the many pastures into the deep woods. After he had trudged for about an hour, he came upon a dense area which he almost never saw, except in the fall, when he and his two sons went out to cut the woods for the winter fuel supply. The route was almost impenetrable. Then he heard the clank of a cowbell. He knew to be one that was hanging around the neck of his long-lost Lilibel. Eagerly, he took out a pocket knife and cut through the dense vines that hung across the path. Finally, he drew aside a branch and, frozen in astonishment, there before him were not only Lilibel and her calf, but a shiny, grotesque monster. Its metal joints, arms, reached motionless out to him in some seemingly purposeless contortion. The old reverend's eyes bulged, his mouth flew open, and he stood speechless before the object for which he had searched so long. There, before his very eyes, was his old enemy, a still for making bootleg whiskey. For a moment, he stood with fire in his eyes and a steadily sweating breast. Then his eyes filled in a portion of the small tree trunk laying on the ground. With a scoop, he clenched the branch and began swinging at the beast. It was an easy victory, and soon the smash still lay dented and crushed at his feet. Little Bell, soundingly ignored, even insulted, watched the strange proceedings with soulful eyes. Then, seemingly thinking her master had suddenly gone down, chose to lead her baby off to another thicket. Her absence was not noted as Reverend Reeves, his victory achieved, emerged elated and strode towards home. Soon dark clouds and ominous fears flitted across his agitated brain. Why was it still on his farm? Were his sons involved? Perhaps the older ones? Suspicion and doubts benumbed him until he knew he could not act. It had been easy to attack the moonshiners when their activities were secret, and he knew nothing substantial about them. Now that he had concrete evidence, he felt it would be better to say nothing. The guns of the moonshiners were more to be feared than the moonshine itself. One day, to the surprise of the old preacher, the sheriff drove into a 
sheriff's yard and upon being invited inside proceeded to arrest the preacher's oldest son Ob and a companion Orville Redwine who happened to be there at the time in an effort to clear himself of being a stoolie Reeves later told his son if I had known why the sheriff was there I would have let you out the back way with these and other arrests made in the neighborhood it was evident that someone had gained knowledge of the bootleggers and had gone to the sheriff most of the victims believed the preacher to be innocent of turning them in that dumb old guy one was heard to remark he couldn't find a tick in a dog's ear someone for sure had gone to the law but who accusations of foul play ran wild there were shootings more than usual and tempers were short and just won't to see the blood run bragging one bully after he shot a man farmers guarded their homes and locked up their guns always a favorite object for theft one morning in the cabin jenny watched a wide-eyed astonishment as dad strapped on a gun belt loaded a pistol which she had not seen before and put that fearful looking weapon on in its holster she was relieved to see that he was only going out to work he worked in the wide open hay field with his gun in easy reach of his right hand. It was all very strange, as he had never carried a gun before, except for a rifle when he went out hunting. Jenny did not ask why, but she watched and wondered in her accustomed silence. The efforts of the preacher and the arrest by the sheriff were not a drop in the bucket towards rid- ridding the Ozarks of the bootlegging business. It is believed, exact statistics not available for obvious reasons, that the illegal liquor business was the primary source of the small amount of money floating around, and that the bootleg liquor brought in more cash to rural Ozarks than any other single enterprise. Some folks say that the ghosts of the moonshiners still operate, that homebrew and white lightning are made today and transported to market under bale of hay and other farm products, that it is stashed alongside farm machinery or guns for sale to all parts of South Missouri and even into northern Arkansas. But then the Ozark people have always been known to have a great imagination.